Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world today, and welcome to AdAge's custom webcast, sponsored by Clarivine. The topic of today's webcast is how digital marketers can win today by preparing for the future. I'm Christopher Hosford with the AdAge team, and I'm your moderator today. Welcome, everybody. But first, a little bit here about our sponsor. Clarivine is redefining data integrity for the global enterprise. They make it easy for teams to standardize, connect, and control data collaboratively across the organization. Leading brands use Clarivine to take greater ownership and control of their data from the start for better decisions, customer experiences, and ROI. Now, before we start, we have just a quick, few quick items to go over. We'll hear from today's presenters, and then we'll open the floor to your questions. Now, to participate in the Q&A portion of the webcast, all you have to do is type your questions into the Ask a Questions text area, and you can submit your questions at any time, and we'll address them as time permits at the end. So now, first I'd like to introduce our presenters for today. Alex Lancher is founder and co-CEO of Cardinal Path, a web analytics, search optimization, and marketing consulting firm, and one of the largest pure play digital performance measurement firms in North America. It's committed to helping clients leverage their initiatives to convert visits to value and prospects into customers. We also have Miles Younger, Senior Director Data Practice at Mighty Hive. Miles leads the Mighty Hive global data practice go-to-market team, commercializing the solutions that will help brands maximize value from their advertising, marketing, and customer data. Prior to Mighty Hive, Miles was an ad tech entrepreneur and built the canned banner dynamic creative platform. Now we also have Jackie Lee, head of publishers at SimilarWeb. Jackie works with companies in the publisher and media space to build engagement, ad sales, and subscription goals using SimilarWeb's strategic and actionable insights. Now per, prior to joining SimilarWeb, Jackie was director of audience and data strategy at the New York Times. And lastly, we have Neela Brown, head of customer and competitive insights and analytics at Equitable. Prior to her current position at Equitable, which we joined just recently, Neela was the global head of measurement for Havas Media. In this world, role, she worked as part of a team working to help transform the agency's strategic processes. So one more thing before we begin, we have a brief poll for our audience uh, that will actually uh, pull you a little bit on who's spearing your organization's post-cookie strategy, which, as you know, is going to end probably in 2022. And poll number one uh, asks uh, the following, who is spearheading your organization's uh, post-cookie strategy? Let's see. Uh, the choice is here. Would that be me, someone else internally, someone from the agency, or a consultant? So who is spearheading your organization's post-cookie strategy? Now, as the answers are coming in, I just want to remind everybody that you can post your questions at any time to single one of our panelists or the entire panel as a whole, and we'll answer them at the end. Well, I think we've got just about all the answers that have come in. So uh, let's, put, uh, let's push the uh, results to the audience and uh, see uh, what the final results are. Well, it's pretty well spread across the board there, uh, with most people responding someone else internally, but at least someone is handling post-cookie strategy. Um, folks, your thoughts about that? Well, let me uh, let me start off by asking you a very uh, pertinent question that, uh, about that very, very topic. You know, as we know, there's at least two major adjustments that have been announced regarding online privacy, and I'd like to address this first question to Alex. Um, how are you or your clients approaching privacy changes, including identifier for advertisers, which app, Apple has updated recently for its uh, iOS of devices, as well as Chrome's cookie deprecation? Alex, what are your thoughts? And we'll hear from the other panelists as well on that question. Yeah, well, thanks very much, uh, Chris. It's a, I have a lot of thoughts on this issue because there's been a tremendous amount of digital ink that's been spilled in the past uh, I know, 18, 20 months. Um, and it's a subject that I've been really focused on at Cardinal Path for some time. And, and I'm just going to kind of gently push back and say I want to reframe the question because what's important to me is 
is that, you know, we approach these changes from the perspective of instead of like, what do we want to do? And, 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 and sorry, we want to do this from the perspective of what do we want to do and how does this help consumers? Because I think that right now, when I'm talking to clients, what I typically see is questions around what's going to break, what won't work, what won't I be able to do? And, and, and then the, the corollary question of that is, is, you know, how can I work around that? And I'm just not sure that right now that's the most productive mindset because it's been made very, very clear to all of us by Google and Apple and others that, you know, they're just not going to tolerate workarounds. And that includes things like third party uh, identifiers, you know, think about, um, yeah, you know, ID 2.0. And that's um, that's just a bummer. So I, I, I think the concern about how can I get around this or what's going to happen is, is a mindset that's going to cause us to lose time and, and wasted effort. So I think the shift has to be towards more of what do we want to do and how will this help consumers? And if we do that, like what's beneficial to the consumer, what's beneficial to the business and you know, ultimately maybe even society, then we're talking about what are the experiences that we can offer in a privacy safe way. So that's my kind of top line message. It's a, so let's rethink this from a tech thing to like, what do we want to do from uh, the consumer and the experiences? And if you, you shift to this, right, um, then at a tactical level, I think we need to ask ourselves, uh, how do we raise awareness? Um, what are the assessments we need to do across the organization? And then what are the actions that we need to take? So if I, if I kind of unpack that, you know, awareness, we've just done a tremendous amount of education to clients about this. And, and it's really, really important that people don't view this as being something that's going to be solved by Google or solved by Apple or, or solved through a tech res, uh, response, because this is fundamentally an organizational solve, right? This is really about um, the, the organization kind of coming together and, and understanding that they have to rethink their value proposition. They need to rethink the way they manage data. They need to rethink the way they collect that data yeah, and, and make sure that they have the consent uh, in place to do so. And even though cookie deprecation was pushed back to 2023, I think we still have very little time on this. And, you know, I can share with you that it breaks down to I think about 30% of people are still not aware, 30% of groups. So I think that Google or somebody else will fix it. And 30% are starting to take action and about 10% are really ready to roll on this. So the first step is assessments, right? Like how big is this problem gonna be for them? Like what is their first party data set? And you know, we've heard people talk tons about first party data set. Um, my sense is that you know, consent is first and foremost part of that. Data governance is pretty clear that you have to have that baked in as well. And, you know, if you've got data partnerships, you know, kind of look back at those data partnerships, you need to assess what those look like. How reliant are you on the kind of the sugary syrup of Facebook and retargeting? Because both of those are going to be heavily impacted by IDFA and, and, um, and cookie deprecation. So, you know, we just first need to understand the lay of the land and then if we do that, then I think we need to move into action, right? So the actions are, what are the sequence of steps? Because we don't really have that much time. And particularly if you're a large organization, it's, it's hard, right? It's hard. So what are the series of steps that we need to take that will most rapidly help us get on a, on a path towards collecting fully consented first party data that cons contains like, you know, just the right amount of PII that's going to help you support your modeling. And if you need more, then you know, make sure you've got the consent in place and that always attacks the data and you've got that value exchange that's really clear and you can incrementally get more, more data. And, and then the, I think the, the last thing on the action part is, uh, you know, what do we need to do to recalibrate our measurements and our KPIs? Because the reality is that right now, we still do have cookies. Right now, we still can do a lot of stuff. Right now, you know, Chrome and 60 plus percent of the browser market share. So we, we can start to develop models. We've got a long timeline to do that. And that's what companies are going to have to do because, um, it, you know, that's, that's, that's going to be the big challenge is how do I take the data that I currently have and use that to expand that um, across the data sets that I might be losing in the future and then start to test that out. Um, Alex, I, I just wanted to piggyback on, on two things that you said. Uh, mm -hmm. Firstly, agree with all that fully. Um, I just wanted to, go back to something you said relatively early on in your comments um, and kind of expand on it is 
this notion that there is a, a value exchange that brands need to offer with you know the expectation of getting first party data in return this idea that brands need to earn it but to take that uh, a slight step further is that if the value exchange is valuable enough to the consumer a lot of the sort of privacy anxieties are they begin to be rendered moot basically so there's just a tremendous opportunity there where it doesn't mean that you can just whatever throw compliance and security out the window and and you know you still have to to treat all those things with uh with care but if you're offering something that consumers genuinely want then no amount of privacy changes is really going to undermine that so like there's just this huge opportunity that brands have to uh to really develop that and then the second thing was um just i love what you said about you know people well brands they shouldn't wait around on this to be solved by google because i think yeah the, the pace of re recent announcement uh, announcements has just like underscored why no one is riding to the rescue here we're 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 probably looking at another like you know 18 to 24 to 36 months of frankly chaos with respect to announcements by google Apple, Amazon, Facebook, uh, uh, you know, uh, we probably are, we'll probably get a crazy announcement like next week. And so uh, the onus is really on brands to uh, to take control for themselves and, and like you said, first party data sets. Yeah, I totally agree with you, you know, Miles. Um, the, the, the thing is, is we can't control what others are going to do. We can only control what we can do. Right. That's the fundamental thing. Right. And we also need to recognize that this is not a technology solve at the fundamental thing. It's about what are we what are we providing to 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 our customers and our clients that that matters to them. And if we stick within those bounds, we don't ask for anything that's you know more than what we need. And we establish that trust relationship. And I think that, um, you know, you're going to be in a much better place. And fundamentally, you know, scale is going going to matter at the end of the day here, right? Those brands that are able to collect the most first party data and start doing the modeling are the ones that are going to be in the best situation going forward. And so that has to start today. And I think we've seen that everybody's pushing the logged in state or the authenticated experience. Um, you know, it's hard. It's hard to get people to authenticate. Then that, that really means not thinking about what matters to you, but really what matters to your clients. And again, that's a mind shift, right? That's a mind shift. And then how do I always recognize that the data that I have is, is loaned to me? I, and I, if I treat it with care and I make sure that I'm always over delivering on the things that matter to uh, my audience, then I'll be able to maintain that data and build on it. And again, not technology solves. I think one thing too that I'd like to, to push it. I mean, I, I agree with everything that you're saying here. And, um, you know, my perspective is a, a little nuanced. I mean, I'm coming from um, a publisher, but I was also on the brand side of the business where we're really trying to build relationships, exactly what you're saying, building that first party data set. But we're also at the time looking to drive subscriptions. Now I'm on a vendor side and we're doing um, a cookie list measurement, cookie list insights. Um, I think. One thing in, in working for a publisher and working with publisher clients is that as much as we talk about building this relationship, there is um, there are still commercials that are associated with this. I mean, publishers have to sell ads and monetize that content in that way. And they're also looking at starting to build subscriptions as an additional revenue source. The as much as like there is this desire and and ambition to build these relationships, I do feel for all these brands because they're kind of stuck behind between a rock and a hard place. You've got the Googles and the Apples of the world. Um, precisely, kind of you know Google's announcement uh, had had components of basically saying that they wanted to reapproach web standards, which to me is like if you're redoing the foundation on which all of these vendors, all of these brands are transacting. How in the world can anyone? like build that relationship while knowing the ground on which they're, they're building this is shifting. Um, and so absolutely to your point where it's, you know, what can brands control it is absolutely building that, that direct relationship. Um, but I think it's also leaning more into context, which, you know, is, is yeah. Yeah. 10 years old, but that's out of the control of Google. That's out of the control of Facebook. So how do we get smarter about leveraging that particular, uh, approach? I just wanted to jump in a little bit different, I think, of a perspective. 100% agree kind of with, um, you know, what everyone else has offered, especially um, coming from the agency and, and that, 
you know, I think aligns with a lot of the work that we did there. But now being on the brand side, I think, Alex, one of the things I believe it was you or Apple is going to solve it. And I think that there is a need for real education internally at brands in terms of the impact of, of these changes. Um, and while you may have centers of excellence in digital marketing and media who do have a true understanding of what's going to happen and the impacts of IDFA and cookie deprecation, how does that information proliferate, in particular knowing that investments may be may need to be made in order to do things like stand up models, invest in different kinds of data assets. And so how do we create a dialogue with decision makers who maybe don't always have strong digital expertise and build that conversation so that we do all get on the same page and we're able to make those investments in a timely manner that does set us up all for success in 2023 or whenever it is that, that it actually finally comes to fruition. Oh, yeah. Look, I mean, uh, again, totally aligned with everything that you said. And, you know, I, I you know, as a as somebody who kind of runs an organization, I see how difficult it is sometimes to move an organization. And in some places, it's it's easier, right? And others that are in regulated industries, it's extraordinarily difficult. And there's all kinds of strictures around how data is managed. So to your point, you know, when I when I when I've spoken to clients about this, uh, it is, it is super important that they realize that this is, in some cases, an existential threat to the business. Yeah. Right? And yeah. I don't know if you can put it in strong enough terms. It's number one. Number two, you know, context. Context, publishers have context. And I think that there's going to be really a, a second wave of greatness for publishers because they're going to have that relationship and they've got context. And if we lose a lot of these targeting tools and context is going to become super important, and there's been a lot of work that's been done on that. But but brands as publishers, uh, it's nothing new, right? That's not a new concept. I mean, you see what Yeti's been doing for a while. I mean, this is brilliant. Patagonia is the same thing. But I think this is, this is a, again, a challenge, right? Because the ability for us to target in the open web is really being compromised. And so we're going to be and making measure. policy yeah. bargains, right? Where we're going to have to say, all right, so I've got these various ecosystems which I can leverage and, and market within, which is great, except that now I've got fragmentation. And that's super hard and complicated to manage at an organizational level. And, and I don't think anybody wants that. And I'm looking, I'll just put this on the table. Maybe we can come back to it. But if you think about what Apple is doing right now with its relay, you know, virtual relays for it's obfuscating IP addresses or the, uh, the decision around email addresses, email addresses. I mean, we're talking about, you know, there goes cookies, there goes IP, and now there goes email. So, you yeah, know, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things that you just said, it being like an existential threat to the way that we have traditionally done things is, is really important. And I mean, I think that you see it on, on small scale, like even when campaigns are in market and people don't quite understand perhaps why things aren't performing the way that they traditionally did. And you have to have a conversation about the fact, well, now there's a data gap. We aren't getting all of the information that we historically used to get. How can we use kind of, you know, what we already know um, about cookies being deprecated in places like Safari to learn? about what this might mean and how it is that we then set up, you know, the right infrastructure to support things like measurement in particular, where I think that's one of the places where this is really starting to come to light in terms of organizational conversations, because that's where um, I think, at least right now, like we're at least seeing some of the rubber hit the road where, you know, things that traditionally performed places like Facebook, um, maybe the numbers aren't quite what we were expecting um, based on his history. Yeah, the sugary I think, <laughs> I, I think one a, thing. That's a good, that's a good point. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I thought uh, this whole identification of, of, uh, of, um, of people on the web is changing very rapidly and very quickly. You know, I'd like to ask the panel um, a, another question about the evolution of marketing best practices. You know, it seems to me that so much depends these days on data standards across an organization. Um, Neil, let's start with you. Um, how are you uh, or your clients or your associates addressing core data challenges and structures to ensure data quality and data standards? Neil? Yeah, so um, I think one of the first things is, you know, obviously there are, there are a group of people who are, are well versed 
first in kind of some of the, the increasing fragmentation of the data landscape and what it is that that, that means from an implication standpoint. Um, and I think that where we're starting is what are our core use cases? What is the data that serves those use cases? Um, what, based on what it is that we know now, will be the gaps or are the gaps that we're beginning to see and how it is that we think about there's also an op and I really responded well to the way Alex set that up in the last question. There's so much opportunity with all of these changes in terms of what we can build and how we can think differently. Um, but it also you know, allows us to, to better understand our infrastructure as it stands and whether or not now that we are kind of in this place where we are looking at use cases, auditing what it is that we have, where it is that we have gaps and what it is that we need to build and what that means for how our data is managed, how it's organized, how that could feed in to new use cases, I think particularly in the modeling space to, to you know, how it is that we, we pull through on things like measurement in particular um, and have that good conversation. I think that, that you know, every organization is set up a little bit differently. And so there are good conversations to be had that are specific to marketing, but then how does that play into a broader enterprise data strategy? And how do we ensure that those things are harmonious? Um, knowing that we need to be flexible and we need to kind of set ourselves up for an unpredictable future. Um, and so having those good conversations across the enterprise, I do think are important. Neela, you, you mind if I ask a question? I'm curious, sure. coming coming from the, the brand side. Um, so, <clears throat> like, I think a lot about the, the the problem of data governance and and, and data standards and, and extracting value from data. Mm -hmm. And you know, we all kind of puzzle over the question of, well, why is marketing and advertising and customer data so broken? Like, why are we kind of left with this like very broken ecosystem, either within a brand and agency ecosystem wide? And I think about it as sort of this tragedy of the commons where, uh, you know, you've got for a large brand, for a large company, you've got potentially hundreds, maybe even thousands of like teams, agencies, technologies, all collecting data, storing it, modifying it, analyzing it, activating against it. And they're all kind of acting in their own self-interest. And so, you know, for each one of these respective entities, you know, maybe they're hitting their KPIs and then you go up to 50,000 feet and you're like, this is a mess. Like there's, there's it's just noise. It's, it's a bunch of like cats all running in different directions. And that seems to me like one of these sort of just core barriers that needs to be overcome, one of these core organizational problems that needs to be solved before you can then move on to, uh, you know, coordinating around a data strategy, having data standards, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just curious, you know, what your sense of that is from the brand side and whether or not like that's something that you're that you're experiencing as you as you're going through this process. Um, I, I think that there's definitely some accuracy in that. Obviously different brands are at different levels of data and digital maturity and so they've solved some of those challenges in different ways. Um, I mean I, I think that we can all probably agree that, that the way that the the ecosystem and the landscape has changed so rapidly in the past, you know, 15, 20, 10 years, um, there have been things that have sprung up and decisions have been made. And originally, you know, a decision sat with one stakeholder and then it, it was realized that actually, you know, that's something that applies to everyone, not just somebody who sits in media and marketing or, you know, there is the need for a broader fundamental underlying data strategy that sits across an enterprise. I think that that's why I still think that this moment in time is, is a critical one because so much is changing that it's forcing these kinds of conversations. Um, I know that, you know, at Equitable, we are talking regularly to our enterprise partners to figure out how it is that we account for the things that we are going to need moving forward and whether or not there are implications to how it is that we think about things and how we can work better together and start to solve for some of those issues. I think that one of the other things too, and again, every organization is different, is that in a lot of organizations, technology and data don't always necessarily sit with the same decision maker. You might have your data scientists sitting very, very separately from, you know, the people who are making MarTech decisions. And so how do we bring those people together and, and with people who are charged with marketing enablement and be sure that we understand all of the use cases that this underlying infrastructure ultimately needs and force, not force, but, you know, bring them together to have those good conversations, um, knowing that, that there's a lot to think about right now. Yeah, there was just one thing I, I wanted to say. Sorry, Neela, and, and then I'll I'll see the mic. Is it occurred to me a couple of months ago? Is I was wondering, digital advertising at this point is say twenty twenty five years old, and I was wondering, has it ever attained a stable state? 
if you ask any particular brand, have you ever, do you have any baseline ever in the entire 25 year history of digital advertising? Can you point to a point in time and say, that's our baseline, that's our source of truth? And I'm wondering if that's also part of the problem is if we just let her never, never had a baseline. Anyway, I'll, I'll shut up. Well, I actually do have something and actually um, great point to make. Cause I was actually thinking about the same thing about how, if you think about digital advertising, part of the reason why I feel like we're sort of in this situation is that the industry sort of bubbled up and everyone that works in it was like, Oh, we can self govern ourselves. It'll be fine. And clearly that didn't necessarily happen. So now we've got like um, not just changes from Apple um, and Google, we've also got regulatory uh, shifts like GDPR caught everyone a little flat footed. Um, CCPA, like that regulation is not stopping and it's because as an industry, we just didn't regulate ourselves very well. Um, I think one thing too, it's like when sort of, um, one of the challenges that I see is basically convincing organizations of the urgency of this. If you think about this, Google announced this cookie list deprecation 18 months ago, granted COVID happened. So, but it's not a lot of time and getting this quote unquote stay of execution for two years. I'm starting to feel like brands are like, Oh, we got two years. It'll be fine without understanding that being reactive means that they're still going to be caught flat footed when cookies finally go away. And that they're missing the fact that to date brands have been reactive to GDPR to CCPA. There's going to be more regulation that's coming that they're not proactively preparing for. And for, for me and with the clients that I work with now, it's really, I think, um, a matter of raising the urgency of the situation where it's not just cookies, there's all of these other headwinds that are coming and you don't know yet what all of the, um, like how, how, how tangled that web truly is. You don't know which systems, which, uh, campaigns, which strategies are going to be impacted because it's been so reactionary. You know, I'm I, I aligned with everything everybody said. And, um, I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm just going to bring it down to kind of a, a little bit more of a tactical level here, <laughs> if I could, because all these things are true. All these things are absolutely true. Uh, but when I go into an organization, what I find are typically three reasons why data is compromised, right? So we can't control what we can't control. We don't know what Google will do. We don't know what Apple will do. We, you know, probably it's not going to be in our best interests. It's going to be in their interests. But um, what I can control is, uh, I want to make sure that when we are building experiences, that all of our digital agencies are on board and understand the criticality that the experiences must be measurable, right? So they can't deploy experiences, hand it over to the measurement team and say, tag this. That doesn't work. That's that's wrong because that's just going to lead to really complicated data streams coming out of that. That's that's not sexy. It's not very high level. And it's absolutely fundamentally important. Um, the, a similar one is taxonomies. I mean, you think about large brands that have global reach and the taxonomies of their campaigns are a mess because there's one agency that's doing social, one agency that's making the creative, another agency that's deploying this. And so these taxonomies, when this stuff comes back, Miles, to your earlier point, right? You know, this stuff is, is coming back in spaghetti because you can't really line these things up properly. And, and um, you know, I, I think the last thing that we have to recognize is that the platforms are screwing up the data, right? So the data I'm getting back from an iOS platform is not going to be the same quality of data anymore that the data I'm going to get back from an Android platform or, or anything else. And now uh, with the most recent changes, even the Mac OS platform is going to shift too. So now I've got data almost incompatibilities by platform that I need to tr control for. Um, I've got regulatory frameworks, as you said, Jackie, that I need to understand and be mindful of. But fundamentally, what I can control is to make sure that there are common taxonomies that all my agencies adhere to and woe betide them if they don't. That we have data standards that are baked into our data layers that people understand and design to. Otherwise, the experience doesn't go live. And if we at least control Pull that, then it, you know we're going to at least get some standards and some interoperability of our data sets, and and that is going to enable a lot of the stuff that we all want to do. But that's foundational. It's nobody really gets promoted for it, and it's absolutely critical. But I I think that that's an important point. Like it's foundational, and that's where this notion of how it is that we proliferate education throughout an organization yeah. in terms of what it is that this foundational element powers 
Um, you know, everybody wants their scorecard. If we don't have the right data infrastructure in place, we can't always read out on the right. key KPIs that management teams are interested in, um, you know, whether or not it's a campaign performing or what it means in terms of impact to overall business ROI. And so that's why I, I, I and I know I said this in the last question, but having that proliferation of, of education in terms of the impact while important throughout an organization, the right people in at the right point of a conversation. You know, if we're bringing our data and measurement people in when things are planned and just asking them to tag and track when everything is set to go to market, we don't have the opportunity to influence that infrastructure, that taxonomy in the right way. We're just kind of trying to patch things together. I think there are two that, that you know, may in a lot of Yeah. Well, Neil, I, I think you're absolutely right about trying to patch things together. Um, with all these changes, it strikes me that it's increasingly difficult for marketers to have to try to figure out all the various evolving digital identity solutions. It's a, it's a weird future out there. Um, Jackie, I'll start with you on this question. In which ways um, are you future-proofing your own or your clients' advertising and marketing best practices? How does the future look to you and what solutions are there out there? So, you know, I, I think I, I touched on this a little bit earlier um, on the on the concept of context, where that's something that, you know, it's not it's less about who the person is, who the target, who the audience is, uh, so much as where they're spending their time, the environments in which these folks are going to, um, the content that they're reading, all of that stuff is more about where they are instead of who they are. Um, I think that's one area to think about. Um, the brand that I work for, for similar web, we actually are completely cookie-less. The platform was built cookie-less and continues to be cookie-less. Um, the way in which our, our platform um, sort of uh, creates the models that we, we do have is through a contributory network that doesn't rely on cookies um, through partnerships and in some cases through direct measurement from brands. Granted, data is not perfect, but given that these are brands that are telling us um, the the actual performance as, as accurately as they can, um, it is a way for us to train our modeling so we can still at least give directional insights um, for our customers. I think that's one of the things when we are talking to uh, the brands that work with us. Um, you know, one of the things that I think uh, Alex, you had mentioned um, in, that, in the last question was around um, shared understanding, shared taxonomy, shared foundations. But that foundation is, is shifting in a lot of cases. It is not just about tagging, but then it's like, well, then what? What options do we have? Is, is, do, are, are we relying back on surveys? And in some cases, maybe we, we are. But in other cases, and it's like, okay, if we can't tell who they are, can we at least figure out where they're going? And that's something that when we're talking to our clients, given that our platform um, is built in such a way where we're able to provide these customer journeys, perhaps without view through, but at least from a click through perspective, we can at least give um, high level insights into. Um, the paths and the journeys and the, the overlaps and the affinities that are happening in the marketplace, even if it's not tying directly back to a person. Um, knowing that, you know, with what Google is, is doing, we, we, we don't know what the new web standards are going to be. Um, and we don't know what Facebook and Apple and Amazon's responses are going to be to whatever Google proposes. Um, I fully expect that at some point in time in the next year, there's going to be a whole bunch of new stuff for us to, to think about. But at least today, in terms of what we can control, this is sort of where we've gotten. I feel like at least for, for the value that my customers are seeing from our platform, we're at least getting them closer. Um, especially since for now, we do still have cookies. We do still have at least some insight, um, some measurement. We can at least provide some uh, degree of old versus new comparison to help at least think strategically and think about shifting. Anyone else like to chip in on that, uh, um, that you issue? Know, it, it, in terms of future proofing, um, the, uh, the perspective I like to take on it is that right now in order to future proof, uh, it's an exercise in building, and this is for brands, I'm really speaking about brands and perhaps publishers, in building things that you can no longer buy off the shelf. 
uh, where, uh, in large part, uh, the function of digital advertising had gotten kind of addicted to really what can be construed as sort of these brute force mechanisms performance for audiences, conversions, et cetera. And a lot of that stuff is either breaking down or it's just retreating uh, inside opaque walled gardens. And so what's left is for brands to really build back a lot of these things for themselves. And the, the inconvenient truth is that buy your way out of these challenges and you can't just buy the things that are going to future proof you you know i'm thinking in terms of things like control alex tall talked about uh you know having mechanisms in place to get agencies to comply with taxonomic standards that's not a thing that you can just, just flip a switch on you're gonna have to work for that a bit um there's things like agility you know, the speed at, at which uh, the world runs just increases every single year and organizations need to become more agile. Again, it's not a thing you can just buy your way out of. Uh, attribution, huge challenge. And you can't just whatever, tag everything with your MTA platform anymore. Uh, and then right. lastly, we've already talked about first away. party data. And, and I, I'm sorry, what was that? I was going to say, because view through is going away, like there's exactly. no way to do that anymore. Exactly. And anyway, the last one I was going to mention is first party data acquisition, which we've talked about enough. Again, you can't, it's not just something you can just go buy off the street. The one thing I would push on with first party data, there's actually two. One is scale. I mean, it's like you can, you can be the New York Times um, and have however many millions of subscribers. Um, but when you compare the reachability and the, the number of systems of platforms where you can actually port that data around and actually get a solid match, scale is very small relative to like where the industry is today. Um, I think that's one challenge with that. And the second is, um, you know, Alex, I think you raised this earlier about Apple's privacy relay. I mean, they're they're basically obfuscating IP. They're obfuscating email addresses. So all of this work that's gone into collecting this data, it's like, well, now what? What do we do with this now? Uh, How can we use it? It's the data. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. You know, right. Yeah, that's right. Well, there's a whole other. Yeah, it, it's exactly right. Look, I, I think it's a. Uh, it, there's a, you know, Miles's point, your point, you know, we can't buy our way out of this. I, I think these things are, are, are completely true. And, um, uh, what I, what I will say is that, um, you know, we're going to have to get, if you talk about future proofing, we're going to have to become comfortable with modeling, right? It's just, there's just no way we're not going to, because I don't know what the size of your data sets is. You know, Jackie, you talked about those that have scale will win, right? But the, the truly scaled, uh, entities. I mean, they're just beyond most brands capability, right? So uh, if I want to play, if, if I want to seed my ownership of this data and I'm going to play within the Amazon ecosystem or the, you know, eventually possibly a Netflix or the Apple ecosystem or, you know, all these addressable marketplaces where they have, have these large data sets, if I want to seed my, my ability to own this data and always kind of vest it with them because they're not going to let me get that out for all kinds of regulatory reasons. Uh, well, that's one strategy, but it's an expensive strategy. Um, it might be the right one, if, uh, and therefore what the cost is the cost. But to an organization, you know, you're talking about a highly fragmented management system uh, within your marketing teams, and that's that's just hard. Uh, the The other thing is that uh, I think I think we're going to everything when it's old is new again, right? I mean, I think this is really good going to be the age of of golden age of publishers jackie you know new york times they have extraordinary insight into their audiences and certainly page fair did that pretty interesting study with uh, the netherlands public broadcaster where they found that um uh, you know using simple contextual advertising and no cookies whatsoever they were able to get really good bang for the buck and of course you're cutting out all these middlemen right all the dsps and everything else so I, I think that's a, that's a chapter that's still yet to be written, right? And that's going to preserve, I think, the open web. And that's kind of my, my big thing in all of this is that I don't want to see the open web kind of get balkanized. And so the, this recognition that there's a really good publisher level data that's all based on really good contextual understanding of the audiences through you know, a lot of modeled interactions, I think that's a that's a big opportunity. And one of the questions that I had for you, Jackie, is 
Have you seen on similar web that there's been like a post COVID and a pre COVID behavior shift? Like, like uh, has that yeah. data shifted? Because, you know, a Absolutely. lot of the models that we develop don't really persist in the post COVID world. We're having to redevelop a lot of these. Absolutely. I think, you know, one of the things, um, and, and, you know, if, if, if we've, we've got several blogs about this, but it's in multiple industries where we've seen consumer behavior shift. And I think that's also something that we're seeing in, um, uh, that, that other brands have also released their own research on the same topic. I think behavior has shifted from um, sitting in front of a TV to mobile devices. Um, it has shifted from how they consume media. So to your point about publishers and having this be a golden age for publishers, that may be true, but the way in which we think about publishing, we think about, oh, an article, we'll just read the article. People are now consuming more of podcasts. They're consuming more of right. um, right. streaming yeah. videos. And so it's like, how do you still capture that audience when you know they're not reading anymore? They're not reading as much as they were pre-COVID. I think one other thing at the times, and um, you know, I, I had touched on this a little bit earlier about shifting from being um, reactive to trying to get proactive on this. This is something that I think Times Advertising has done a fantastic job of, and they've been public about this. Um, but advertising put a stake in the ground uh, a little while back and was like, hey, you know, we're going to make a deep dive, a, a big bet into developing more direct relationships. The same time they were developing these podcasts, these um these TV, uh, TV properties, building out ancillary products to basically have a suite of products that they could then sell to advertisers in almost like a direct value add way. But I think one thing that was really, really interesting, um, is that exactly to your point, there's a team that actually developed these modeled contextual audiences that you could only buy directly. Um, and it has from a, from a brand perspective, from a future proofing advertising perspective, I think that's one area where the times is, I think really shined in that. Um, so whatever happens with cookies, they don't necessarily need third party yeah. data because they've got, um, these context based segments. Um, and again, with the first party audiences that they have built, um, I think Neela, you were saying that was you were, were you were talking about modeling, is that right? Or was that Miles? Sorry. Um, but they've also built up these models of first party data audiences that replicate some of the reach that at least if you're coming directly to that brand, that um it's replicating what people are getting through third party data today. It's more accurate, it's performing better. Um, and it's building a, a niche and building um brand stature in the industry ahead yeah. of needing to. That's a good point, Jackie. Uh, uh, excellent way to wrap up that, that particular question. You know, it strikes me that we're really talking about a cultural shift that affects every corner of an organization and might include the need for new skills or retraining. There seems to be a lot of things that might go wrong, uh, hurdles that can trip us up uh, without people being heads up about it. Uh, Miles, let's start with you on, on your thoughts. If you could name one thing that seems dramatically overlooked for the future of digital advertising, what would you say it is? And then we'll, we'll uh, turn it over to the rest of our panel. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I, I'll, I'll try to keep this answer short and apologies in advance if it seems a, li a bit academic, but uh, actually based on today's discussion, I, I do think it's kind of an important and overlooked connective tissue to bring a lot of these things together. And the, the thing that I see being overlooked is strategies around the intrinsic value of marketing and advertising and customer data. So like that data is typically treated as kind of a commodity. Marketing itself is in accounting terms, a cost center. So all this data is just kind of an exhaust from a cost center. But we can see that some businesses are winning and have gained a competitive advantage just based on their data sets alone. So like we know that data is an asset with value, but I don't see very many people in the industry talking about measuring that data intrinsically. So, you know, just a couple of examples would be, you know, many organizations measure the cost to acquire a customer, but are they measuring the cost to acquire data? Or are they measuring how much data they acquire, for instance, per dollar spent in media? Um, if 
we assume that data uh, uh, gets more valuable the more data sets you can connect. Are businesses measuring the uh, kind of additive value of bringing together uh, marketing, advertising, and customer data sets? Um, and so I think what you can kind of develop if you start to look at data based on these intrinsic qualities um, is you can actually start to develop new and even better KPIs that uh, can be kind of more commonly used throughout an enterprise that aren't these sort of pigeonholed marketing uh, and advertising KPIs like, you know, things like ROAS, et cetera. Um, and so anyway, that, that, that's the thing is, is just as data just increasingly takes over the world and increasingly takes over digital marketing and advertising, I'd like to see more focus placed on understanding the intrinsic value of that data. Who else would like to chip in on that? Uh, I, I thought Miles wrapped that up pretty well. Hurdles uh, uh, to overcome mistakes wow. people are overlooking. I think I'll jump in with something that's a little bit different, but just the impact of um, how, how an organization is set up and how, um, you know, decisions are made relative to to how it is that we push things forward, how it is that we actually think about cultural shifts um, and and influence that across an organization, um, and you know how it is that we continue to break down silos that may ultimately result in in longer timelines to addressing some of these issues. I think that the way that an organization is set up has a ton of impact to work with or that you work for and how it is that you move through that in an effective way to get these things done is really critical, especially given our timelines. You know, you know, I, I, I'll, so I'm in violent agreement with you. And that was the kind of my thinking about this is that, you know, if you think about it, most organizations today, the org structure of most companies, it's analog. It really reflects the time, uh, a previous time. And we've grafted onto these organizational structures, a digital capability set, but fundamentally it's still kind of an analog model, right? And so uh, I think that CMOs in particular are going to have to fundamentally rethink their um, their org structure, because if, you know, going to Miles' point and just going to, I mean, Amazon did 20 billion in advertising last year, that's just Amazon. Um, the, uh, the reality is that they're going to, you know, why is legal over there? Legal should be right here because it's all about data. And we know there's all kinds of regulatory risks that are associated with that. So why do we need to go outside to the legal team? That should be baked right into the the CMO's team for everything that pertains to data and those legal resources need to be super swift and smart about not just the regulatory framework, but the data sets that are in there. Um, think about, I mean, it is, it is it, how fast it is today is the slowest it's going to be in the future. It's never going to be any slower than it is right now in the future. And so the change, the pace of change is so fast. So what are the systems that orgs are putting in place internally so that they can be on top of these changes um, because they have material impact on the business, right? If we, if we agree that COVID really pushed all business digital and, you know, a lot of digital is mobile, you know, business is mobile. I mean, these, these are some fundamental impacts. That's why I'm so concerned about Apple and I keep coming back to it. Um, well, you kind of have to have a lab right within the CMO's office that's really thinking about that. And then from an organizational structure, how do you manage across such a fragmented ecosystem and have people that are kind of dedicated within that? Because really right now, if, if, you know, if we think that, well, 50% of all products are just start and end on Amazon, well, it's pretty hard not to have a team that's just doing that, you know? And so do I now need to organize my team around the platforms, right? So, I mean, I, I, I see a lot of people optimizing for minimums, right? Spending a lot of time on these small incremental things. And I think we, we have to really sit back and say, what are the bigger bets here? And kind of move some of these pieces around. And, and I think organizational structure, which is super tough, is pretty key. I think, you know, I, I agree with what everyone has said here. I think one thing that I would raise that maybe is a slightly different POV is that what I feel like gets lost in this is actually the consumer themselves. We talk mm -hmm. about all of these different um, 
We've got, we talk about all these different data structures inside of a company, um, the value of the data, the silos. I completely agree with all of that. But I think one thing that I think about is that we forget that customers actually like advertising. They yeah. like having targeted ads. They like having song recommendations. I like getting recommendations from Zulu's or whatever the, the new brand is to check out a purse or whatever. Um, I think what we forget about is that, you know, in, in our rush to sort of correct the, the, the mess, I guess, of the targeting industry, it's like, we've forgotten, like, are we serving the, our customers, our, our consumers, um, in the best way, I think you know what I what I understand of it is that consumers just want their data protected. They want to be treated with respect. Um, they don't want to be creepily tracked, but they do want recommendations for products, and that's something that, as we as an industry develop strategies, develop products, um, you know, it's it's something that I have to keep reminding myself that it's like, hey, you know, this is still advertising existed because it was a good thing. It sounds good, Jackie. Well said. Well, you know, it's time for our Q&A portion of our webcast, and we'll, we're just about ready to open the floor to your questions. But before we do that, we have a second poll uh, of our audience to ask about marketing taxonomy and data standards. The question is, is marketing taxonomy and data standards important to your organization? Yes? No? Mm, I'm not sure what those are. Pretty simple question. I see the uh, answers coming in. Just to remind you as you answer the question um, that this presentation is being archived and you'll receive notice when it's ready uh, for download and review again. So it looks like is marketing taxonomy and data standards important? Yes, and I think that speaks for itself. Well, let's go right on then to, to our questions. We have quite a few good ones that have come in and one of our attendees asks, is social media more concerned than the big brands, or should brands be more concerned about the paradigm shift on cookies and personal information? Social media versus big brands. Who's afraid of the, of the shift in privacy? Who would like to take that one first? Um, I, I would just say that um, the general rule of thumb is whoever's got uh, large troves of first party consumer relationships is going to be okay. Now, you can dig down further below that and start segmenting things out, but uh, for large social media platforms that have uh, a large scale sets of, of uh, consumers who are logged in and engaging every day, uh, I think generally they're in an advantageous position. Anyone else like to chip in on that one? I would agree with that. I think for social media brands, yeah, think about TikTok influencers. They're not necessarily relying on cookies or or, or IDFA to to reach um, or to help their advertisers reach their target customers. The target customers are spending their time in these environments already. Yeah, I think um, I would say I would agree with that. And I, I actually think that big brands are likely pretty okay too. Um, depending on their level of, of first party data and how it is that they're engaging in the marketplace. I would actually say it's probably smaller brands that um, you know, should be the most concerned, um, you know, given the potential scale of their first party data set, how it is that they need to think about building that out. And then also um, you know, how reliant they are on some of these strategies that are really IDFA or cookie based. Vines agreement. You know, one of our attendees asks uh, about joining a new company. And I think, uh, I think this is uh, something that um, he should be concerned about and uh, would like your opinion on it. Question is, I'm about to join a new company, more than $500 million in revenue. As a marketing executive, uh, where should I start related to what you've just discussed today? Anyone like to take, take that uh, hardball question? Well, I, I can take a stab at it. Um, okay. You know, so your ability to market, um, if we if we if we start with a couple of things, right? What are the what are the guide rails? So the first one for me would be what is the regulatory environment telling me that I need to do? So if you want to do digital marketing like we've been doing and like we would like to do in the future, and just talking about the data sets, just from the data sets perspective, 
You'd want to, and this is almost anything even any PE firm should be doing if you're thinking about acquiring a company. You want to understand what, what data do they have about their audiences? And is that data that they have about their audience as their consumers, is that consented data? Do they have the right to use that data? So that's number one, right? What is the data they have? How is it collected? Is there consent that I can attach to it? And how is that data managed so that I can activate it? And if the systems aren't there, right, the technical systems aren't there, and that's the easy thing to look for, then the road is going to be steeper, right? Um, do I have the people in the organization that are switched on enough that they can, you know, turn this data into insight, kind of like the whole thing Miles was talking about? Does that capacity exist within the organization, yes or no? And if it does, it's a plus. And if it doesn't, you're going to have to build that. And right now, that talent is exceptionally hard to find and expensive. So, you know, that's a challenge right there. Um, and then, you know, you're going to have to start making some bets, right? At, at some point in time, is is, all right, um, is the experience that we're putting out into the, into the public, is it the experience and it's that brand ethos, is that the one that's going to get relationships such that people are going to want to authenticate and want to allow me to leverage their data through, you know, again, having all the consent stuff in place. But do I have the, the ability to create that value equation and that experience that's going to lead to that type of deeper relationship? And if you don't have that, then, or, or it's going to be really difficult for you to create that, that's going to be a challenge. I think about all of our clients that are in regulated industries, or even changing a comma on the website requires five layers of approval, right? That's going to be a challenge for those people because their time to action is just constrained by the regulatory framework they operate in. So, I mean, those would be some areas I'd look at. Um, so one thing, Go ahead. Um, one thing I would say is it's obviously critical to get to know kind of, you know, people who are in leadership roles and understand kind of how, is that it's equally as important to get to know some of the people that are managing programs on a day-to-day -day basis to understand how it is that these things are actually functioning. Um, people that, you know, maybe a little bit more hands to keyboard or are, you know, sitting with an agency or something like that to, to talk about how it is that data is actually activated and can talk through, um, you know, the reality of the practical use of some of it. I think that there's a lot of value that you extract from, from those conversations, just as much as some of the more strategic conversations, um, you know, that, that you may have with leaders. Sounds good. Well, you know, uh, one of our, the, the only thing I, I, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Alex. Oh, uh, I was I was just going to uh, add on to the the, the recommendations for this uh, sort of hypothetical marketing executive is to start what business does work backwards there, especially in the context of, of having around privacy, et cetera, is do your home on what this model is and for example, Sure that you are not committing a marketing strategy, for instance, to a model that basically depends on all of this third-party data, you know, continuing to function, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to just start with what it is the business does today and how it plans to adapt to the future, and, and just start to work backwards from there, or else that you're going to just kind of go down a road that's frankly going to be a dead end. Thanks, Miles. Well, we've reached the end of our time. Thanks to everyone for attending Adage's, Adage's custom webcast sponsored by Clarivine. Now, if we didn't get to your questions, that we had many great ones, we'll definitely follow up with you later and uh, answer them uh, as best as we can. Now, remember, you can also view and listen to this presentation on demand using the same link you used to attend today. You'll receive an email as soon as the archive is ready. So on behalf of our guests today, Alex, Miles, Jackie, and Neela, Thanks so much for your time. Have a great and prosperous day. Thank you. Thank you.